Good afternoon. And it's quarter to four, and let's start our last panel of the day. Uh, very happy to see you so many still in, in the audience. And, um, well, we have heard quite a lot during the day, and uh, there are numerous countries in the enlargement process from the candidate side. There are even more EU member states, but there is still one country that is more on our minds than, than anyone else, and obviously that's Ukraine, uh, because of the ongoing war, and that's why we also pay special attention, special tribute to, you, uh, to Ukraine during this conference. And the war, Europe, European integration, obviously those topics are closely interlinked. Because, um, as it has been said already, yesterday, 10 years ago, the Maidan revolution, the revolution of dignity started. And obviously the reason was uh, the refusal of President Yanukovych to sign the association agreement, which the young people felt uh, would take away their future, their European future, and Ukraine had wasted a couple of decades already. And this uh, continuing uh, with um, an unforeseen end, well, that was just not acceptable. And the massive or the, the, the full-scale war that is now going on, um, approaching the end of its um, second year soon, uh, well, the main reason for that as well was that um, for Moscow, Ukraine was inevitably slipping away, slipping towards the West, making its own choices about uh, its future. Um, so um, um, Ukraine, Europe integration and the current events are uh, intimately linked. And to discuss this, uh, we have an excellent panel today, starting uh, from the very end, uh, Dirk Schubel, uh, Special Envoy for Eastern Partnership in the European Union's uh, External Action Service, you have been dealing with the whole region, but uh, Moldova and Belarus would be the countries uh, you would know even more intimately than, uh, than, than the rest of the region. Uh, Tanel Tang is an Estonian diplomat, but uh, currently with the European Commission, uh, always working with Ukraine, uh, EU delegation in Kiev, uh, then SCUA uh, in Brussels, and now the engineer of the European Commission um, dealing with, uh, with Ukraine. Yannick Merilo, well, I don't know even uh, where to start. Your, your Ukrainian connection is uh, right from the birth. Uh, but, um, well, you've been involved with uh, Ukrainian reforms, both at the central government level and um, local level, although uh, for Estonian scale, Dnipro and uh, Lviv are not that local, but uh, big cities. And uh, these days, you are even more known for the for assisting Ukraine for the NGO uh, Royam Slava, and um, uh, well, you have been combining Ukraine and Estonia in your life. Well, uh, for the Estonian audience, uh, I should say that uh, you are still somewhat more famous in Ukraine, having been uh, you know uh, voted into the top 100 most influential women uh, in Ukraine uh, on on a few occasions and and all that. So uh, very happy to have you, and. On the screen, we have um, a legend in Ukraine, Father Serhii Dmitriev, a chaplain, a priest, uh, a lieutenant in the Ukrainian armed forces uh, with a call sign uh, Padre, uh, head of Eleus Ukraine, which is um, the um, charity work or the good works um, branch of the Ukrainian Orthodox um, Church. Um, Serhi, I hope you are hearing us and uh, well, obviously, um, as, a, as a priest, you have to develop um, reflexes for staying calm, but uh, that could also mean <laughs> that uh, he's not hearing us. Well, Anyway, uh, let us uh, let me still turn to Serhii first, and uh, let's see whether we will have a, a meaningful connection. Uh, Serhii, Serhii's war 
I mean, we often look at the war or many people's work, life has been affected over the last less than two years. The war has been going on, of course, the Russian aggression against Ukraine has been going on for nearly 10 years. And Serhii has seen it from uh, close quarters uh, for all that time as a, as a chaplain and um, has been trying to um, to assist the, the, the soldiers um, doing the fighting and also those um, in, in Kiev or in other parts of Ukraine. Um, well, I should ask you, Serhii, what has given you, the soldiers and the Ukrainian people, the, um, the staying power? How have you managed to, to keep the fight up for, uh, for 10 years? And as a chaplain, it's, your, it's part of your job to give, to give hope to people. Where do you get your own hope from? So, Serhii, over to you. Serhii, прошу, можете відповідати? Well, if we can, I hope we can get the connection fixed meanwhile, and, but then as long as it's not working, then uh, I'll, I'll turn to Janika instead first, and then we'll, uh, we'll return to Serhii. Well, uh, if for, for Serhii as, as a Ukrainian priest and, uh, and the military person, the war is personal, so the war is personal for you as well, um, obviously. Cities dear to you, Kiev, Lviv, Dnipro, have been bombed with, with missiles. Um, people whom you know are fighting at the front. Um, well, how do you... So, so it's obvious that it's logical that um, you could not stay aside. You have created Heroem Slava, the NGO. Um, how do you... How has it been going, assisting the, the Ukrainian war effort? And I know one of the most difficult things you are doing is trying to get the um, Ukrainian children that have been taken to Russia uh, to get them back. What can you tell about that? Well, thank you. Actually, our um, NGO, let's say, was launched last year, even though we started different humanitarian causes in 2015. But uh, we started, of course, from uh, supplying Ukraine with drones, because Estonia has uh, very professional drones, and Ukraine needs them tens of thousands per month. But actually, during this last year, we understood that we as IT specialists, I come from IT, from digital transformation, there are some causes that we can be even more helpful than just donating money or uh, donating things. And um, we joined the team of Commissioner of Human Rights of Ukraine, Mitra Lebanets, and his, uh, and his uh, Yes, team to locate and to bring back uh, deported Ukrainian children, because you, Russia is saying that it has deported over 700,000 Ukrainian children, 700,000, if you can imagine. We hope it is less, but by less we mean still 200,000, 250,000 children taken away from Ukraine, from their families to summer, to camps, to kindergartens, to Orthodox uh, uh, parishes in Russia, all over the Russia, and actually try to locate them using GOSINT, open source intelligence, not so open source. And by locating, we can help to bring them back. But it's, it's every time it's like a small special operation. It's extremely hard. Russia doesn't give them up, doesn't give them out. We have managed so far uh, in total to bring back 400 children uh, with Estonian help uh, over 10 t children. And it's, it's extremely complicated because even though we see the fates of the children, we see the lists, we see where they're located, we simply cannot bring them back because Russia is not giving them up. So every child is like you know hostage negotiation, basically the same. And it's like small children, they're starting from six years old, they're being re-educated as Russia calls it. It means basically almost concentration camps where they're uh, forced to, I don't know, sing Russian uh, national anthems where they're um, 
basically punished and tortured based on their nationality being Ukrainian, and it's a true genocide, and it's a genocide by President Putin. It's systematic, it's constant, and unfortunately it's a genocide that is held by many organizations, including Orthodox Church, and yes, it's a very personal and special mission for us, trying to bring them back, and it's going to last for years and years. Indeed, but it's um, hard to see any activities that would be more important uh, than that. So, of course, uh, uh, I, I guess Ukrainians are grateful uh, to you uh, for, for that um, activity as well. Returning to reforms, uh, you have seen reforms then in the central government, in, uh, in the Ukrainian cities. So not just one government, one party, but uh, a process over many years and in different places. If you would summarize your experiences, I, I, I imagine, well, we all know Ukraine's reforms have been successful and that gives the, the reason to start accession negotiations with them. But certainly there have been headwinds in the process as well. And even if in some cases Estonia well, we have shared our experiences with Ukraine, and in some cases now we are learning from the Ukrainians, like uh, mobile-based um, electronic governance, for example. But uh, what's your reform story in Ukraine? Oh God, so many stories, <laughs> starting from 2015, actually. And it has been very challenging, meaning that um, in 2015 the reforms were more made in the level of local municipalities, meaning that some progressive cities wanted to change something, and the mayors gave a mandate to these young reformers, and they managed to do something from down to up. Uh, actually, after the President uh, Zelensky came, uh, he um, started many reforms from up to down, meaning, for example, e-government. Yes, you can try to make some changes in the city, le le city level, but then again, it makes more sense to make it in the central government level because so many services are, are centralized. So what is not very known about Zelensky is that uh, even in his election program, uh, he was really this e-president, meaning that he had a very uh, big attention to e-government and his mission was to make a government in a smartphone. And I think this is one of the most uh, probably successful reforms that have has happened in Ukraine, meaning that uh, uh, transforming the services to m smartphone and to internet. And this is one of the reasons I think also why government is still up and running, meaning that uh, despite of uh, so many refugees, uh, so many services centers being closed, people can still access government services, can still get their subsidies, can still book their times to doctor. It's, it's, this e-government reform has been extremely important, but I'm so much looking forward to and actually have been fighting for the justice reform, where Estonia is also helping, because uh, unless you can uh, protect your rights and assets, everything else is secondary, unfortunately. And uh, we've, we've seen everything, like basically reforms have been... Uh, uh, shifted back and then... Uh, Let's say it's not a guaranteed thing that you make a reform and it stays like that. It's a constant struggle and it's like a windmills. But then again, when you get something done like a government in smartphone and Estonia comes to learn, it's so like rewarding, really. Uh, well, I still have to ask you when, as you mentioned already, difficult reforms, more important reforms. Uh, you have written a book about Ukraine. And uh, in that book, you say you say about um, the fight against um, corruption in Ukraine. Uh, well, it's like uh, fishing on Discovery Channel that, you know, a, a fish is being caught, uh, shown on camera and then released. Uh, do you see changes compared to the time you wrote the book or what's your take on that? Uh, everything that I said kind of will be used against me, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, it was a book about reforms in Ukrainian. It was in Ukrainian for Ukrainians, Ziavid Yanike, and I shared my experience in reforms from 2015 to 20, and it was exactly this long, hard way of uh, passing the bills, uh, amending the legislation, how it's constant struggle. But uh, no, I don't think it's a discovery channel at this point, meaning that uh, I have higher hopes because the fish is still in the hook and hasn't been... Uh, uh, let's slip away, let's say. But kidding aside, 
I think that Ukraine has a real momentum now to do the reforms and real motivation and real uh, reason, if we could put it this way. And I feel also that there is a huge pressure from people, and this is extremely important, that uh, the government is not only mandated to make reforms, but also the reforms are demanded. So when we are saying that EU demands reforms, well, people also de demand reforms. And this is like historic, uh, let's say, not a coincidence, but historic momentum when the demo reforms are demanded from everyone. So this is why we shouldn't like make any exemptions because the reforms are really needed. And the justice reform, the customs reform, there's billions of uh, gray money in customs reform and so on. They have to be done. And uh, we have to push it. And sometimes, you know, the outside push even helps more than struggling within the system. Thank you. Well, Donnell, yes. uh, your Brussels view is the is the fish firmly hooked, um, all the baddies firmly in the net, and reforms progressing? Um, does Ukraine deserve the start of negotiations? Uh, what's your take on all that? Well, I think that uh, I can start by saying that uh, the Commission proposed uh, to the Council to launch negotiations, enlargement negotiations with Ukraine. And uh, this clearly comes uh, as a result of the efforts that we have seen on the Ukrainian side uh, over many years in uh, implementing reforms which are necessary for the, for the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, but also uh, since uh, summer 2022, when uh, Ukraine was granted uh, a candidate country status uh, with the understanding that Ukraine will implement uh, some uh, key reforms uh, related to anti-corruption, related to judiciary, related to uh, media, uh, also national minorities, uh, uh, the oligarchization. And uh, we saw over the, those uh, months, uh, over this year, that Ukraine made uh, enormous efforts also in implementing those rather, rather tough conditions that we put forward uh, for Ukraine. Uh, we also uh, saw that uh, despite of the, of the war, despite of uh, Russian aggression, despite uh, constant bombing uh, of, uh, of the capital and, uh, and other cities, uh, uh, Ukrainian government uh, was functional, was capable, and the same can be said also about uh, the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, in order to move forward on the uh, EU integration track, you need to have uh, uh, this, this in place, uh, functional, functional state. And in the case of Ukraine, we clearly see this, uh, this resilience, uh, uh, resilience of, the, of the state uh, institutions. Now, um, I think that uh, it's also clear that uh, we are not uh, at the end of the road. I don't think we are at the beginning of the road either because uh, there are many things that uh, have been done, but uh, let's say that we are uh, embarking on the, on the process that will take some time. Uh, and I think that uh, in the short term, uh, what is important uh, for Ukraine is to uh, carry forward those key reforms. I mean, we, we can later discuss some of the elements, of course, uh, anti-corruption, uh, some um, issues that need to be sorted out, for example, with the e-declarations uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, issues related to the de-oligarchization. But it's clear that uh, from the Commission side, there is very strong uh, intention to, to, to launch the negotiations and Ukraine um, uh, basically uh, can just fix some of the smaller things that then would enable us to adopt the uh, enlargement uh, framework and we could start the negotiations as, as soon as possible after that. Well, thank you. We have now fixated on the seven steps that Ukraine has practically got done. Well, there are some discussions about some minor details, but still we all hope for a positive outcome in December. But then also when we think back, about, back to the Estonian accession, for example, which we know, you know best, um, well, in this sense, that's the start of the journey, that uh, taking over the, the rest of the EU, that's still 
a lot of work that will take quite some time. Where do you see, if you look to them years ahead, uh, where do you see the, um, the main issues, problems, challenges for Ukraine? Mm -hmm. uh, we have issued a very comprehensive enlargement report and basically it gives uh, a thorough assessment where Ukraine is uh, with respect to different uh, key chapters and, and, and sectors. And there are some areas clearly where in implementing uh, association agreement, Ukraine has come quite close to uh, actually aligning itself with the EU key. I mean, you mentioned digital transformation, for example, chapter 10, digital transformation media, Ukraine is uh, assessed as being uh, at a very good level uh, of, the, of the alignment. Uh, then there, are, uh, there is another area which I can mention is, is for example, environment, where Ukraine just uh, very recently has done uh, uh, lots of important work on, on, on legislation. But then, of course, there are some areas where, uh, and, and this I think what you actually asked, uh, where further progress is needed. And I think here I would uh, maybe as the most important thing uh, mention uh, the fundamentals. So, I mean, these fundamentals is the most uh, important part of the, of the, of the uh, key, if I may say, put it this way. And this will be the, the essential uh, element also in, in, in progressing on the, because it has impor important consequences on all the uh, chapters, rule of law, of course, anti-corruption. Uh, even though Ukraine has uh, implemented the seven steps, uh, it's clear that this, uh, this uh, struggle uh, should not uh, not stop there. And uh, I think that also one other uh, very important element that I would mention uh, where Ukraine has been a success story, but where we definitely need to see the irreversibility, and this is the decentralization reform. Because uh, uh, being a very big country, having different uh, um, regional centers, it's very important that we try to continue uh, you know, the, giving a chance to this devolution of the power to the to the regional and and, and local uh, local level. Thank you very much, Tanel. Uh, well, let us try to go back to Kiev uh, and uh, Serhii and Tanas Uh Well, the first first question um, that I already asked, uh, tried to ask before. Uh, well, your war, your war has lasted for nearly 10 years, uh, not one and a half or two. It's, it's a very, very long time. And what has given you and the soldiers and the Ukrainian people to last it, and your job as a chaplain to give hope to people, where do you get the hope yourself? Так, ну, э, Твоє завдання як капелана е, дарувати надію людям, е, звідки та ти сам її береш? Е, я б, по-перше, я дуже дякую, що запрошено, і, на жаль, що я не зміг приїхати, і радий бачити таких е, е, людей в Мірному Таліні, вітаю вас з Києва. Е, Натхнення, коли ти робиш добрі справи, ти бачиш результат, коли ти бачиш результат змін, які ти робиш в своїй країні, це завжди дає натхнення. Ну, а головне натхнення – це друзі, родина, твої діти, земля, всі, хто є поруч, суспільство. Це надає натхнення, раді кого ти живеш, що ти будуєш. Ми бачимо ці зміни в Україні, і це надихає. Uh, and luckily, we also have interpretation. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I would like to apologize for not being able to come here in person. Uh, so I'm really glad to uh, see you all here uh, in uh, peaceful Tallinn uh, while I'm uh, uh, calling in from Kiev. Uh, so as to where I get my inspiration and encouragement, uh, it's uh, in seeing the results, because when you see the changes that are uh, taking place, uh, you cannot but help uh, feel uh, encouraged uh, and inspired. And um, the other sources are obviously my friends, my family, my children, uh, my uh, homeland and the people around me. Uh, when you see what uh, you are uh, doing and uh, for whom and for what, you cannot but feel inspired. Serhii, so you, you represent the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and uh, the emancipation of the Ukrainian church 
uh, from the clutches of Moscow, uh, it's also a, a very important part of the story. How have the Ukrainians' feelings evolved towards the two churches, the, the Ukrainian church and the Moscow church, which uh, used to be dominant over the last 10 years, over the last two years? And uh, how do you see that struggle and what is the role and the chaplaincy service in, in the fight against the aggressor? Знаєш, дуже таке важливе питання ти підіймаєш і важке питання, тому що якщо говорити про нього, це, це дуже великий відмір часу, тому що Україна була поневолена в Російській імперії, потім в Радянському Союзі, і разом з цим вона була духовно поневолена через релігійну організацію Руська Православна Церква. You're raising quite an important question and it's a very difficult one to answer because we have to cover a quite a long time span because Ukraine as a country was uh, under the occupation by the Russian Empire first and then the Soviet Union. Uh, so likewise, the uh, church was also under this uh, rule and uh, foreign occupation. Конституція України надала людям право релігійних свобод, але фактично е, узурпірувала релігійну владу е, Російська Православна Церква в Україні. І через свою владу вона насаджувала російську культуру, вона е, руйнувала е, українську культуру, е, відбілювала тих самих корупціонерів, про яких тут говорять, олігархів, е, була такою ганчіркою для прикриття е, кримінальних авторитетів, те, що ми бачили з приходом Януковича. Тобто це була така державна політика Російської Федерації через релігійну організацію в Україні, як повернення до е, Радянського Союзу. І е, інші релігійні організації не мали права навіть побудувати, це було важко побудувати е, храм в якоїсь частині. Україна була розділена, і цей розділ робив якраз представники Російської Православної Церкви. So when Ukraine gained uh, its independence, uh, its constitution established the religious freedoms. Uh, but in fact, uh, it was not so. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church had uh, the rule uh, over Ukraine, and uh, it imposed uh, its rule not only on religion, but also on culture. It was the means to impose the Russian culture on Ukraine and also ruin the Ukrainian culture. Uh, also, they were implementing other policies uh, uh, through the church, such as uh, supporting corruption and oligarchs, uh, uh, also the criminal uh, elements in the country that resulted in Yanukovych's uh, rule that you all remember. Uh, so this was the, uh, uh, the government policies uh, uh, devised by the Russian Federation uh, and implemented uh, uh, through the religious organization, the Russian Orthodox Church. It was their means to bring us back to the Soviet Union. Uh, whereas others, other religious institutions and churches could not operate, they faced different hurdles, uh, such as uh, uh, facing difficulties uh, building uh, churches. To finish your difficult question, I will say that the Russian Church has been blessed by the war and has been blessed by the war. Today, in Ukraine, there is a choice of people to go to the церкву, яку вони хочуть. У нас є чудовий орган, як Рада церков. Це різні деномінації, конфесії, які, які мають сьогодні свої права, релігійні права. Ми працюємо разом. У нас немає міжконфесійних, міжрелігійних конфліктів. Про конфлікти, які ми сьогодні чуємо, перехід парафії, це якраз наслідок того, наслідок, коли Російська церква притісняла віруючих і людей, і інших конфесій. І зараз є такий зворотний шлях, агресія від суспільства саме до Московського патріархата. Я думаю, що це якийсь такий час, який пройде, і в Україні запанує повна релігійна свобода, як в Європейському Союзі. 
And uh, my final point on this question is that uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, uh, actually blasts uh, this war and uh, it still supports it, uh, whereas the Ukrainian people have uh, a freedom of choice uh, uh, which um, uh, faith they belong to, which one they choose, and which uh, church they go to. Uh, there, uh, there is the Council of Churches functioning in Ukraine uh, that unites uh, different congregations, different churches, different denominations, and uh, everyone there has equal rights. Everyone is working together, and we have no conflicts within it. Uh, the only conflicts uh, that uh, you can see uh, now are the results of the uh, Russian policies and the Russian rule and the Russian persecution uh, of other religions and the churches. Uh, so whatever aggression might, might be happening now in Ukraine is actually a backlash uh, against those times uh, and against those policies. Uh, so I think that uh, time will pass and uh, the country will heal. Ну і задача капілана це не змагання у кого більше парафії. Задача капілана і наших священників це перемога жертовними справами, допомога людям, показувати, якою повинна бути релігійна організація, відтворювати соціальні ініціативи, допомагати людям під час біди. Uh, so the uh, main task uh, of the chaplain service is not to compete for the congregations and for the people, uh, but actually to work together towards victory and uh, do that uh, uh, through the sacrifices. And um, uh, we are uh, working uh, all together towards uh, this uh, same goal, uniting people. Well, coming back to Europe and um, let's say the, the more foreign policy aspect, of, of the war, uh, Ukraine's fight is above all about the possibility to make one's own choices, including belonging to the West, joining the European Union. Well, even if you are not a foreign policy professional, but uh, how does it feel to you? Is that uh, a major part of what the Ukrainians are fighting for? No. Uh... Я би сказав так, що, по-перше, у нас було три революції, хочу нагадати, революція на граніті, панранчева революція, революція гідності. Суспільство з, українське суспільство з часу незалежності йде вперед до цих цінностей, які сьогодні пропонують наші західні партнери і країни. Країни Балтії, ми беремо з вас приклад, Естонії, Латвії, Літви, Польщі, Вектор європейської інтеграції обраний народом. І Україна не належить до олігархів. Вона не є власником України. І не належить президенту. Україна по Конституції належить народу. І народ обирає право, куди йому йти. Саме, саме тому е, сталася революція гідності. І як довго ми будемо йти до цього шляху європейської інтеграції, Залежить в першу чергу від українців, але також залежить від наших, від наших європейських родин. Як Європа буде нас приймати і допомагати, чи почують нас. Сьогодні ми помираємо і йдемо на довгий марафон боротьби за нашу свободу, тому що у нас немає зворотнього шляху. Або ми закінчимося як нація, у нас не буде. Але ми будемо відстаювати до кінця права європейської інтеграції. So my first point here is that uh, we, the, as uh, the country, as Ukraine, had uh, three revolutions. So we had the Granite Revolution in the 1990s, then the Orange Revolution, and finally the Revolution of Dignity. And uh, ever since then, our uh, our people, our country, has been going forward uh, towards the Western values. And you, the Baltic states and Poland, uh, you are an example uh, for us. We take your example. And uh, that choice uh, to integrate into Europe uh, to accept the European values, the Western values, it's uh, the choice that our people have made uh, because the um, rule and the power in our country belongs to the people, not the oligarchs uh, and not the officials. It belongs to the people. And this is why the revolution of dignity happened. Uh, it is uh, a, long, um, uh, a long marathon that we're uh, 
we are undertaking and it will take a long time towards uh, integration uh, but the goal uh, and the result uh, they uh, um, depend not only on uh, the Ukrainian people but al also on the reaction from the European community community from the uh, EU uh, we have to be uh, uh, heard yeah, it is a long marathon, but there is no way back. We know that. Uh, Ukraine knows that uh, we either succeed uh, along this path uh, or we will disappear as a nation, as a people. Ну, і я би хотів би сказати, що ми високо цінуємо всіх тих європейських політиків, громадських діячих, просто людей. Коли ми чуємо добрі слова про Україну і віру в наш в тих людей, які борються за європейськість України. Коли ми говоримо про корупцію, тут багато слов чув про корупцію в Україні, але треба знати, що корупція народжується з, Рос... з... з тої Російської Федерації, тому що всі олігархи, всі кримінальні авторитети або бізнес, корупція веде свій шлях через саме російські коридори. І Щоб, якщо б у нас не було б е, військового вторгнення з 2014 року, можливо, ми б, як активне громадянське суспільство, подолали б багато проблем внутрі країни е, е, намного швидше, ніж ми можемо це робити зараз. Війна перешкоджає нам швидше інтегруватися і побудувати європейське демократичне суспільство. Е, Я рахував приблизно, скільки ж загинуло людей в Україні за цей час. І мої цифри не будуть точні, але я можу сказати, що від 50 до 70 тисяч людей ми втратили. І це активна частина населення України, яка ну, її неможливо оцінити. Це громадські діячі, це волонтери, це ті люди, які були на Майдані. Багато з нас кого вже просто немає. Діти наші виростають, і вони борються за те, за що боролися батьки. Десять років – це велика, великий час, а з одного з іншої сторони – маленький. Але ми не будемо зупинятися, і ми, звичайно, цінуємо ту допомогу, яку, про яку говорять сьогодні в парламенті Європи і інших країн. Ми дуже дякуємо uh, the support that we receive from the European politicians as well as the European people. Uh, when we hear that uh, uh, you believe in us, uh, in uh, those people who are fighting and dying for those co causes, it means a lot to us. Uh, when we hear that our country is being uh, talked about, but it is also being talked about in um, in terms of uh, corruption, and uh, I want to stress, uh, stress that uh, the uh, corruption in our country actually takes roots from Russia, from the uh, oligarchic system and from the uh, criminal circles. Uh, it all passes through the Russian corridors. Uh, and. Um, I believe, I sincerely believe that uh, uh, had we not had the invasion, the initial invasion in the 2014, 14th, um, we could have uh, overcome all those challenges uh, uh, much uh, faster than we're doing now, uh, because we have uh, such a robust um, activist uh, uh, community and uh, active uh, uh, driven people. But war prevents us from uh, uh, moving further to, uh, in the path of uh, integration towards a democratic society. Uh, in my uh, own estimates, uh, uh, from uh, 50,000 to 70,000 uh, people uh, died. Uh, those people were lost uh, due to uh, the war, and those people were the most active ones. Those were the uh, activists, the volunteers, people who participated uh, in Maidan. Uh, and now their children are fighting for the same causes that their parents did uh, because 10 years is uh, uh, both uh, a long period but also a very short one. Uh, but we will not uh, uh, give up, we will continue fighting and we appreciate the uh, support we receive from you. Ну і на кінець я би хотів би сказати, що я перепрошую за свій час, що Ми віримо, що Європа, яка декларує сьогодні європейські лідери, які декларують захист прав людини, а це і захист прав на життя, захист прав 
тих цінностей, які созідає Європейський Союз, він буде розповсюджуватися на Україну, тому що ми є частина спільного суспільства на нашій планеті. Ми не зможемо вижити без захисту навіть політичного, тому для нас важливі такі спікери, рупори сьогодні європейських країн, які розуміють, що відбувається в нас, і які надають приклад також нашим політикам, як правильно себе поводити. І сподіваємося саме на таку дальнішу підтримку від кожного з вас. Дякую. And uh, finally, I would like to apologize for taking so much of your time, uh, but uh, I would like to say that we uh, very much believe in the European, uh, in what the European leaders uh, have been saying, uh, what the European values are, uh, such as the rule of law, the human rights, uh, and uh, above all, the um, right to live so all those uh, all those values we believe that they apply to ukraine as well and uh, that they will take a collective uh, uh, effort from us and from our uh, our society and uh, we also believe that uh, uh, we cannot survive um, alone and uh, that those uh, values are worth uh, protecting uh, and uh, Your speakers, those who are uh, raising um, all those issues related to Ukraine, they are very important for us to hear, but also they are very important for our politicians to uh, give an example uh, on uh, how to uh, behave and how to uphold those values. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. I'm very happy that we can see you on the screen and hear you. Дуже дякую. Я сподіваюся, що ти можеш з нами залишитися ще на 18 хвилин, якщо будуть і питання. Well, thank you very much. And uh, obviously those um, losses uh, are the, the horrible flip side of the heroism of the Ukrainians and of the reforms that are, are being passed. But um, surely the, the Ukrainians uh, will prevail in the end. But uh, Dirk, well, you see, you hear the expectations towards Europe, towards the European Union are high. Um, how can we help Ukraine? How, how are we helping Ukraine? Thank you very much, Gerd, and thank you very much for inviting me yet again this year. I feel uh, very uh, privileged. And I feel even more privileged, and I feel almost a little bit embarrassed to speak after such a a legend, as you rightly uh, said, uh, a hero, I would even say, uh, Father Serhi, uh, let me start by expressing my deep respect for what you are doing for yourself and for, for your work. Much, much appreciated and uh, it is very visible here. Thank you. So with, uh, with this, uh, I think uh, besides the uh, historic decision that Tunnel rightly mentioned on the, uh, on the recommendation by the European Commission to provide uh, to start to, to give the green light for the start of negotiations to Ukraine and, and to Moldova as well and to Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think still uh, the number one priority by far is to help Ukraine win this war. Ukraine has to win the war. That is the number one priority because everything else will fall apart and will not be able to, to, to materialize if this doesn't happen. So um, let me perhaps start by giving you a few figures. That's why I have my paper here uh, by what we have already been doing uh, for Ukraine uh, in terms of numbers because it's, uh, it's enormous. Um, 84.6 billion euros have been paid since February 2022 to help Ukraine by the EU as institutions and by the EU member states, out of which, uh, just to name the military support, and that brings us to the, back to the geopolitical role that the EU is now playing, uh, 27 billion euros in terms of military support both through the European Peace Facility, but also by member states' uh, uh, support, 17 billion for refugees, and both refugees uh, uh, who have left Ukraine and internally displaced persons inside Ukraine who moved from east or south to, to the west. 5.8 billion for humanitarian uh, assistance. Just today we paid the next tranche of the macro-financial assistance, 1.5 billion for the month of uh, December already. 
Um, so this is uh, just to give you some idea of the figures and to show that uh, who would have thought that two years ago, who would, who would have thought two years ago that we would be able to spend 27 billion euros on military support organized by the European Union. Uh, un un unthinkable uh, still. We have our mission, EU uh, military assistance mission, which in the meantime has trained 32,000 Ukrainian soldiers. The, ga the, the goal is to train up to 40,000 until the end of the year, and I think we can manage this. We have, um, um, uh, and that is perhaps not a direct support uh, for Ukraine, but equally important, we are uh, close to finalizing the 12th package of our sanctions against, against the invader, against Russia. So we hope to have that um, uh, out very soon. I cannot talk uh, about it now, but Commission and, uh, and EAS and um, the High Representative, my boss, has recently proposed this package to the member states, which are discussing now, but it will be a package uh, of both personal sanctions, but also sectoral sanctions. Uh, again. Um, we also support uh, Ukraine's efforts on the peace formula. There have been several meetings on this topic, as you know, in different places of the world, and every time there's a new meeting, there are more people, more countries taking part. We had uh, in Malta, I think, more than 60 countries participating in these uh, discussions. So um, I think that uh, will hopefully also continue, and hopefully we can nail down uh, a formula that is acceptable also to the global south, which is very, very important in this context. Uh, another topic that we are dealing with now is you know that many EU member states have already uh, agreed um, uh, security, long-term security commitments with, uh, with Ukraine. Now we're also doing that on the EU level. We are also discussing now the EU security uh, commitments. That will be our next uh, step in this. But obviously the ultimate uh, security guarantee is membership in the European Union. And uh, I'm not working for NATO, but of course also NATO. Um, so that is uh, to give you an idea that uh, there's full support and the good news is, and to reply with the, uh, or to, to refer to what the Secretary General of the uh, Estonian Foreign Ministry said this morning, um, and there's an answer to which uh, we bureaucrats can say very much yes, and that's good news for Ukraine, because uh, the question, if the, if the question is asked, is there any fatigue in Brussels on support for Ukraine? And the answer is no, there is no fatigue. Uh, so the answer is full support uh, is continued to be given uh, to Ukraine. I don't see any fatigue and I hope that this will remain, of course, for as long as it takes, as we always say. Um, on the enlargement package, I don't want to say much. Uh, Tanel mentioned this, of course, there's a lot of work ahead, but uh, I hope, of course, that the Council in mid-December will take a positive decision. Uh, I'm convinced it will take a posi positive decision, in fact, so that uh, indeed negotiations can start as soon as possible to have this par parallel track ongoing as fast as possible to, to be ready for the moment uh, once the war is won and that uh, Ukraine can move, can dedicate all its resources to the preparations for accession. Um, talking about this, of course, Ukraine was not the only country that uh, got the status. Let me just say one word about this as well. Moldova got, uh, as I said as well, uh, the, um, the same um, uh, historic recommendation that uh, negotiations should be started. I think very, very well deserved for, for Moldova as well. Moldova has been uh, probably the third country most hit by the Russian aggression apart from Ukraine. It has taken on a lot of Ukrainian refugees and they're still there, many of them, and other has done a, a marvelous job in preparing for, uh, for uh, the accession process. So I think that is also very well deserved. We are helping Moldova as well, just to say one word uh, as well. We have opened a mission as well, uh, in a uh, 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 civilian mission, which is called EUPM, which has a very similar purpose than EUM that we have in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine already for a couple of years. Uh, namely to strengthen the internal security mechanisms in, in Moldova. Um, of course, uh, also there's also some support from the European Peace Facility for, for Moldova, as well as also for Georgia, which brings me to Georgia, which is also uh, now uh, the recommendation by the Commission is that it should become a candidate country. We hope that the European Council will confirm this as well. And also Georgia receives some funds from the European Peace Facility. We hold security dialogues with, uh, with all the countries in order to prepare them as best as possible. And of course, we have a, an ongoing mission there, uh, EUMM, uh, uh, Gerd and I, and a couple of uh, special envoys for the Eastern Partnership from EU member states were just in Georgia two weeks ago, and we saw with our own eyes, uh, and the day before, one Georgian had been killed by the Russians uh, uh, on the administrative line, and we were able to visit the, the administrative line with the help of EUMM, also in solidarity with Georgia. Georgia, of course, there are a few question marks, but I think overall, 
it is the most logical decision to the, the recommendation to for candidate country status because uh, Georgia belongs to Europe. The people uh, are belonging to Europe as they always express themselves on many occasions. One last word on the Eastern Partnership. That is my main job, um, uh, as you know. Um, uh, what will happen to the Eastern Partnership? Um, well, indeed, we have now mostly, most likely soon two countries with whom negotiations will start on accession. Screening process will start, and we have hopefully also a third one, Georgia, which will catch up. That is our wish. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, I believe that, uh, of course, the countries will dedicate their forces into that. But we still believe that the Eastern Partnership can be helpful in this context. There will be the screening process alone, and I know that from my own experience uh, in the past uh, working in DG enlargement, will off will open a lot of, or will discover a number of uh, of uh, of. Uh, uh, of gaps that need to be filled and we believe that uh, there the Eastern Partnership and can come in with its possibilities and to, 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 to help in preparing the countries even better for the negotiations of the different chapters uh, uh, in, later on. Uh, by the way, we also had just a senior officials meeting on the Eastern Partnership, a virtual one, in which every uh, country basically confirmed the relevance for the time being of the Eastern Partnership. How long? I wouldn't uh, uh, put money in for 10 years, but I think for the next few years, the Eastern Partnership will still remain relevant. Uh, Poland, by the way, announced uh, in our senior official meeting that they will that they intend to hold the next Eastern Partnership Summit during the time of their presidency, which will be in 2025. So I I think we can safely assume that uh, at least until then the Eastern Partnership can be helpful. And by the way, we have most likely a deliverable for the Eastern Partnership Ministerial in December, and that is a regional roaming agreement. And that is a very concrete deliverable uh, that that can that we can uh, tick off and 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 uh, announce at, the, at this meeting. Uh, I think that would be very good uh, and very with very concrete, uh, feasible and uh, visible. Uh, or listenable uh, uh, help uh, once the uh, once this agreement is enforced that you can communicate freely. Um, so uh, to, to to put uh, to come to an end, uh, full support for Ukraine is our number one priority. But let us not forget the others who are on a similar track, and together we always have been stronger. And that goes also for this. Slava Ukraini. Hello, Slava. Uh, well, thank you, Dirk. Um, thank you also for. Um, exploring the Eastern Partnership. I, I was afraid already that I would have to press you more on that. Uh, but indeed, uh, as has been reminded today, uh, this format, uh, this conference uh, used to be an Eastern Partnership conference before. And uh, good to hear that at least um, the good old Eastern Partnership has a few years um, left uh, in it. Uh, and then we'll see um, about the future. Uh, well, um, we still have quite a few minutes left, and uh, uh, I would I would be glad to take questions uh, from the audience. And uh, if if you raise your hand, then the, the mic will find you. I know we could have done it differently. We'll have a glass of wine first, and then questions. <laughs> but uh, uh, never mind. Right. James, here we go. The view has been expressed more than once, including by some senior people at our last Leonard Mary conference, that there has been a greater paradigm change since 2022 in the EU than in the United States. Do your discussions confirm that verdict or not? To me? Um, especially you, <laughs> <laughs> Dirk, but anyone else who cares to answer, but especially you and Tano, because you are EU representatives and possibly our moderator as well, if he cares to comment. Dirk. <laughs> Uh, the answer is again a clear yes. Uh, to, uh, so in line with what um, the Estonian Secretary General said this uh, this morning. So um, it has. We have discussions now that I would not have dreamed to uh, to 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 hear uh, even uh, two years ago. Uh, we're discussing in an openness, and uh, um, you know, the, I think. Um, uh, 
with Russia's full-scale aggression, there's also very little uh, left in terms of diplomacy that needs to be applied. I recommend those of you who have the chance, diplomats among you, will will confirm this uh, to see OSCE discussion uh, uh, pay, uh, uh, readouts of discussions in the OSCE framework. By the way, we have a very important meeting soon coming up on the OSCE in, in Skopje. Um, but uh, there is an openness. It has little to do with diplomacy anymore, what is discussed there. It is uh, an open... Uh, challenges, of course, uh, of uh, of the aggressor in the first place, and uh, mostly it's uh, all against two. If I may uh, in include Belarus <laughs> being still on 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 Russia's side, um, so we have um, uh, in but inside institutions as well, we have a very open discussion. We have also public statements which have un been never heard before. Von der Leyen, uh, my boss, uh, Mr. Borrell, uh, been very open. Borrell was one of the first ones who said uh, a month after Russia's full-scale aggression. Uh, Ukraine has to win this war. Um, it is uh, it is not a given. Uh, and I dare say um, that is that is new. But let me uh, maybe use this occasion also to say that I see also changes in the neighboring countries of Russia. Uh, they have become uh, uh, also more also more brave. Um, I have said this on numerous occasions. Uh, um, uh, I think Maya Sandu was asked uh, uh, half a year ago or so whether President Putin would be arrested if he visited Chisinau. And the answer was, if I remember correctly, and Ion Stavila is here uh, to correct me, um, uh, the, the answer was, if um, the, Moldova is a law-abiding country. I think it's a very good answer, and I dare say this answer would might have not been given two years ago or three years ago. Uh, there was more uh, respect, more, uh, um, you know. Uh, but Moldova is is also afraid. Uh, it's not only it's not only Ukraine. And the same goes for many other countries. Armenia, Pashinyan. Look what uh, is is happening. Uh, there is also a shift there. Uh, a lot of interest to reach out more to us again and to 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 increase relations. Armenia, state of play today, would like to be on board with uh, Georgia. And, uh, and Moldova and, and Ukraine in, in many ways. Let's see what the future future brings. But inside the European Union, definitely in, uh, institution, a total change of discussion. The discussion is clear that we have to make sure that uh, Ukraine gets the maximum support and all uh, surrounding factors and surrounding countries need similar support in order to uh, create a, a big uh, uh, virtual or real wall uh, to the aggressor uh, called Russia. I'll stop here. Maybe I expand uh, Tirk's uh, expose on, on three points. Uh, uh, me and Tirk, we have worked on Ukraine uh, 10 years. And, uh, and I recall those discussions, uh, Tirk, that we had. Uh, how can we include uh, European perspective into our uh, talking points, uh, into our co council conclusions? Uh, and uh, usually we came uh, with a very weak, uh, weak text. And of course, now this is something that uh, is completely in our past. So we are talking about uh, candidate countries. We are talking about uh, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia and their citizens belonging to the, to the EU uh, and their future being in the EU. So very clearly, uh, enormous change. Uh, but then uh, if we uh, shorten a little bit the time span, uh, uh, 2022 uh, summer, uh, uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, Moldova became the candidate countries on the understanding that they will uh, fulfill uh, some steps. Uh, nobody talked about uh, opening uh, negotiations or that those steps are conditions for opening negotiations. During the year, actually, very clearly, those steps became the conditions for opening negotiations. Uh, and and even even uh, nobody is uh, is actually questioning that. So uh, I think also uh, a big change there. And then a very concrete example. Um, uh, Dirk, you referred to roaming. Uh, this was something that uh, inside EU services, Commission services, was something that for sure we cannot do because it's legally possible, not possible. We will get to, uh, to, to trouble in WTO. What is happening right now is that we are uh, really looking, uh, both in the case of Ukraine, but also in Moldova, the, in, in addition to this uh, regional roaming agreement, bilateral arrangement that would bring the, those countries uh, into EU roaming space, using actually the EU-Ukraine or EU-Moldova association agreement. So very practical example, which was just very short time ago, clear no-go, 
now a real uh, possibility and uh, something that I'm sure that will be realized uh, quite soon and something also very beneficial both, uh, beneficial both to citizens of, of, of Ukraine and, and Moldova. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tonal. In the spirit of uh, Jonathan Seviev, we are now fighting not only with stronger texts, but uh, with real deeds as well. But uh, Janika, you wanted to come in as well? Yeah, I wanted to expand it even further and say that there is still an elephant in the room, which is called UN, and uh, that the security structures of the previous world don't work anymore. And I think also this uh, war and crisis have shown that basically the old fundamentals don't work. Yes, the EU works, the US, I believe, will work and will support Ukraine, but... Uh, even today, we're facing the situation where the UN and the Security Council cannot work because someone has a veto and that someone is today uh, probably involved in genocidal war. So I think there are still many structures that don't work and that are obvious and uh, where we don't have solutions. In EU, we will have solution. Well, thank you. And thank you all. Uh, well, we've had a rather heterogeneous panel uh, with uh, two Eurocrats, um, a priest, an Aitishnik, if I may, and uh, well, uh, a diplomat. So that sounds like the uh, beginning of a joke, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but actually, uh, I think it's been, um, it's been a good discussion. And uh, um, he, um, he, um, well, actually, what I wanted to say, uh, the joke has... Um, See, uh, well, a sequel, um, a continuation. Well, th what unites those people is that everybody, of course, does one's utmost for Ukraine, and uh, especially Serhii, of course. So we we all hope that um, the victory will come uh, rather sooner than later, and we'll uh, keep up our good work. Uh, Slava Ukraini. Slava. 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 Slava.